Okay. All right. Sun do in the building. Freddie Low, my man. What's going on? There he is, man. Wi Fi right. is looking good. I can hear you nicely. Nice, nice. I was concerned. Yes, sir. <laughs> up. Yo, appreciate you jumping on the low theory, bro. Appreciate you having me, man. You know, good luck and, and man, you've been you've been grinding. Thank you, bro. Thank you, no man. No doubt. No doubt. Just you know, you know, it's all about um the long game, being consistent, man. For sure. For sure. You know what that's I'm saying? What so about. yeah, man, that's it. I mean, bro. Shit, you talking... hit me up a, you hit me up a while ago. You know what I mean? And I remember then you was grinding, but like since that since that point, man, it's just elevating. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, Appreciate you. It's only that, right that I, I had to bring you on, man. I had to bring it, you on, no doubt, man. No doubt. You know, shout out to How could you do the Freddie Lowe show without <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Yo, word up. Uh, I see everybody coming in. Scott, what up? Lee Wilson in the building. All right. What up, Lyle? A lot of familiar faces. Yes, sir. Um, hold on. Okay. We actually, um, so here's what we'll do, man. Um, as you know, on the low theory, we kind of keep it you know, at max, maybe 20, 30 minutes. Um, but I want I want everybody to kind of get familiar with you. I feel like a lot of people are not familiar with you. Right. Let's give them a little bit of history of kind of how we connected um, and then, like, touch briefly on, you know, your your musical career early on. Right. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure how we met because we met so many years ago. Yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's a so little long. bit. It's been a little bit of a blur. Yeah, but man. I know, I know that I, I, I knew you, er, like I had to have met you when I was like at least fifteen or fourteen, yeah, bro. Like yeah, early, early, definitely, definitely. Yeah, and, and we had like a lot point, of mutual friends, man. You know what I mean? So I think the circles oh, was just destined to kind of combine. Absolutely, absolutely, we did, man. We did, um, and that's definitely how we met through through our mutual friends. But like early on, um, I'll just tell you like some memories that I had of you early. Um, I remember you definitely had all the equipment. You probably, yeah, you know, I think you're the first dude with an SP12 in the hood. One of them. You know, <laughs> one, right, right. And um, I remember, you know, vividly you and Haig as a group, you know, and at that point, I think when I met you, you guys were kind of trying to, you know, you guys had this group, but you were also trying to pitch it to some labels. Yeah. Correct man. me if I'm wrong, right? No, no, definitely, definitely. We was grinding, just, you know, doing the demo thing. That was, you know, back then, so it was way different. Pre-internet, you know, pre-Spotify, right. pre-all that. So it's like the grind was real. And with us being where we're from, you know what I mean, we're from Massachusetts. So, you know, there weren't a lot of outlets out here, as you know. So right. you really had to grind and move around to get your stuff known. And we were kind yeah, of and that was doing that. Yeah, that was like one of the questions I was gonna ask too. Is like, especially yeah, coming up in Lynn, Massachusetts, what do you see was was some of the um the roadblocks? You know, trying to get your name known, coming out the hood. Um, really, man, I think it was just a lack of resources, yo. You know what I mean? Like even back then, I mean, we had like the college stations, um, that would support, but there really weren't a lot of venues uh, to perform mm -hmm. that that you know were open to hip hop acts at, the, at that time. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there was the Middle East, there was the classic joints that you could go to. Um, but other than like talent shows and stuff like that, just, you know, Christchurch, Union Street joints, you know what I mean? Right. It's like there really wasn't much much out there, you know, to, to display your talent. So, you know, we kind of right. went introverted with it. And, uh, you know, at this time, I mean, it was it was like the first kind of technological revolution with hip hop because that's when like ADAT came out and that's when like mm -hmm. home recording became mm -hmm. viable, you know what I mean? And the prices were kind of, you know, weren't astronomical. So you right. could put together solid, you know, material at a, at your house. So we were kind of, I mean, I remember being, hey, he's here, he probably remember this, when we put together for like a CD burner, like we had probably one of the first CD burners of Lynn. It was like $500, you know what I mean? But we got <laughs> that joint because like, yo, that was, we was just pressing, pressing, pressing and just trying to get our stuff out there. Right. Um, but Such it was a pretty big much difference. like hand to hand. Yeah, it's such a big difference for, between now and then because now you can easily get a setup with just a laptop, maybe right. some monitors, you know, yeah. just basic basic equipment. But but what you're saying, you're describing back then, you needed a lot of hardware. Yeah, to man. Get the studio yeah. right. Right. And if you wanted it to sound right, you know what I mean? I mean, you could get away with some Bobo stuff, but it's like, who wants to do yeah. that? You know what I mean? But again, yeah. it was like, it, it was kind of at the time where it was like 96, 97, where it was like really starting to transform into like a home studio market and you could really mm -hmm. 
you know, just make quality, you know, broadcast quality material at your house. So that was like a game changer. Right. Um, what was know, the, what was the, what was your, what was the hustle? What was the strategy to get yourself signed back then? You guys created the demo because now all you have to do is upload your tracks oh, to SoundCloud. And if it's right. popping, you might get sound. So what was your grind right. like when you were trying to get signed? Um, when, when, when me and Hegel doing our thing, um, we were more about trying to complete these albums, man. I mean, we, we had a lot of material and it's funny, our history, like I grew up like a couple of doors down from Hager. You know, we lived in the same little housing complex for years, you know what I mean? And all through mm. high school and we knew each other, but we never really connected on the music all through high school. Mm. You know what I mean? We oh, got, word. We, yeah, we caught up later. And uh, I was already involved with, you know, when I was in high school with, you know, some of the cats that I got started with um, that put me on that path. So when me and Hager hooked up, he had already been working with people. I had already been working with people. And we ended up like we was working together at the same spot, a couple a couple jobs we worked together. So we was just kind of thrown together. Mm. Um, and it was like kind of like fate, you know what I mean? And that's when we really figured out, like, you know, we both did music like that. You know, in high school, there was ciphers and stuff like that. But, you know, everyone was doing that. But right. you know, we didn't really know that we had continued on with it after that. So when we linked up, right. it was kind of like a perfect storm. You know what I mean? And really, we right. were just trying to get albums done and sending out CDs. So that was really our, our, our thing was just sending out CDs to different you know, to departments and stuff like that, like straight up mail. Yeah, you got to mail them to the labels. You yeah. got to physically drive over to the record labels yeah. in New and York. And we used to do right? that. We used to do that. We right. used to have to go out there. Do We did showcases out there a few times. And, um, and again, that was like the struggle that I had from previous. So it was mm. always that barrier of access, you know, where we were. So it's like you had to kind of grind it out to get noticed, you know what I mean? And then yeah. with me being, I'm like a low, you know me, I'm a low key type of, type of dude anyway. I'm more about just the work and, right. you know, let the accolades come or let the, let, let someone else promote it, you know? Right. So, at, you know, that coupled with the times, man, how hard it was, it was doubly difficult, you know what I mean? To get noticed. Right. Yeah, for sure, bro. Um, let me see here. What, what, Around what year would you say you made your your very first beat? Hmm. Well, I was, I mean, it was probably maybe 1988, wow. 89. Yeah, yeah. Actually, wow. what, I was doing pause of... tapes. I was doing okay. pause tapes. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, my uncle from New York had kind of put me on to um, like all the New York DJs at the time. So I was listening to that, and then um, like the double cassettes came out. <laughs> I mean, the double cassette, you know, boom boxes yep, or whatever. Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So and like I was always like my dad was heavy into music. So was my mother. Um, my dad actually played bass when he was a teen. So it was like there was always music playing in the house. Like I have distinct memories of being two, three years old and listening, hearing certain things, Stevie Wonder and you know what I mean, the Isley oh, Brothers word. for the first time, and just that like, it cemented that vibe in me at that time you know what I mean so wow. there was always that influence around but the first the first little dabbles I did was like pause tapes with my little boom box and, wow you know what that's I mean? crazy rewind rewinding yeah man yeah. yeah and then you know from there it just graduated into other things like actually even before that man this is dating me but there was this uh Casio came out with this keyboard in like the mid 80s yo called like the SK1 it was the sampling keyboard one and I'm sure a lot of people who make beats remember that and it was you could actually sample like, i had five seconds so you could sample a little beat and repeat it or like your words or beatboxing or whatever so i had one of those and i used that shit till it was until it couldn't work until it didn't work anymore you wow. know what I'm saying? so those yeah. you know from from and that like kind of led into into the pause tapes um, right and i still actually had that you know what i'm saying keyboard it wasn't working but i still had that keyboard in the lab like for years for years afterwards wow. that was kind of like the genesis Right, yeah, but I would right, say that. Right. But like real beat beats, like probably like eighty eight, eighty nine. Um, and I had hooked up with a friend of mine. Um, he goes by Hoskin now. He he's actually he does electronic music, and my man Jasper and we hooked up in high school, and kind of formed this little collective. And uh, we actually ended up renting a TR eight hundred eight from the Guitar Center for like two months, and we just went ham on it. And Mike had the um the DJ he had. The first Newmark mixer that had like the little sample button on it, so you could sample mm. breaks. 
So we had that in the 808, and we would just be in his house, like, skipping school. <laughs> like, days Yo, just making, crazy. making, making stuff in that house. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, that was, like, kind of the progression. Yeah, you know how cats keep talking about the 10,000 hour rule. Like, oh, yeah. You, 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 you've exceeded that. Oh, <laughs> man. So much time's <laughs> over. In every discipline, like, like lyrics, like making beats, like digging, right. looking for records. Like, right. I, I put so many hours in, it's, it's stupid. You know what I mean? Right. But, it's like right. it gave me appreciation for all of it, you know what I mean? And it ended yeah. up like bleeding into the other things that I ended up doing, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, like, I don't want to steal this from Nori, from Nori, but I, I, I truly want to give you your flowers, man, because oh, I feel like you're so underrated, bro. And you have so much talent. Your beats are incredible. Good looking, good like, looking. you know what I'm saying? You know, I've always been a fan, yeah. dog. Like, yeah, man. No and I want, I want more people to understand the, the caliber of your talent, man. That's why right. I want to bring, I, that's why I wanted to bring you on here, man. So um, for those it, who are listening, like, make sure that you guys, you know, even if you don't follow him, at least click his SoundCloud link so you guys can get familiar with the sound because. Yeah, I just opened I'm up some new joints today, actually, on there, so. Word, man, word. You, yeah. you, you, the people need to hear it, bro. Seriously. You can't let it. these beats collect dust. Nah. You really nah, can't, nah. man. Nah, man. You and know? see, this is the whole thing. Like, I need I need that, man. It's like, I need someone like, there's a famous quote from, like, Chris Lighty, rest in peace, from the Quest documentary, where he was like, he would have to go in the studio and just grab stuff from Tip, like, yo, it's ready. And it's like, that's what it takes with me sometimes, like, because I'm, I'm so lost in, in, in the process and you know, chasing perfection in certain points. And it's just like, yeah. and after a while, it just, it, it, it becomes so, so natural and just so part of, of who I am and what I do that it's not even like fed by the need to share yeah. it or get accolades for it. So it's right. like other people, it's like, it becomes other people's job to do that for me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, Yo, you need to check this dude. You need to check this dude. Cause I don't say nothing. You know what I mean? And I've been around yeah. in ciphers. I've been like, you know, and, beat contests or whatever and I'm just, I just play the low you know I got into photography and stuff so I have my camera and playing mm -hmm. the low and little do they know you know what I mean I, sure. I'm there you're, you know what I'm you're, saying you're, yeah yeah even more more capable than what they got absolutely right. so it's like it's good to be humble but at the same time man yeah. I, 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 it, it's a blessing and a curse to be a perfectionist definitely, definitely. you know what I'm saying definitely right and, and, and that's afflicted that. me for a long time man that's afflicted mm -hmm. me for a long time and it's like I'm just now starting to get out of that like the last few years actually ever since i started like the incredibles joints i told you about mm -hmm. it was like my freedom like my breaking out of right everything doesn't have to be perfect just yes. put it together package it yes. and like i ended up doing that for like dude i told you it was like been 10 years it, was, it started out in 2010 and i did one every year until 2020 and it was just mm -hmm. like beats that i had made you know around in that year or, you know shortly before mm -hmm. or after Mm -hmm. That I just put together, like based on moves, you know what I mean, and just on feeling, yeah. just to have, just to, just to get in the mode of just completing stuff, you know what I'm saying? Absolutely, and just absolutely. Have, just saying that's to. done. Yeah, yeah. yeah so that was, I mean, to, that man. was a big learning process for me. But now it's like I got, I'm a little bit more in tune with that to where I can let go, you know what I mean, a little bit. So this word up, stuff man. Coming. You know what I mean? I'm gonna let, I'm uh, letting stuff out. <laughs> listen. You have to, especially now that you're on the low theory. Like, oh yeah, definitely. Now I'm on the spot. Need to. You're on the spot. <laughs> people are watching. People are listening. No doubt. And and, 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 and there needs to be a follow up. So this right. is a little bit of motivation for you, my bro. Oh, for sure. Now for sure. you 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 your beats. Um, you know, you make original stuff too, but you also sample. You're great yeah. at chopping these things up. Explain to the people a little bit about the art of sampling, like. What is your what is your process around it? Um, well, with me, I mean, it's it's all about listening, really. I mean, it sounds so simple, but it's like really being able to listen to a piece of music and you know hear it, you know, and and break it apart, kind of like while mm -hmm. it's playing. So picking out like maybe the strings or picking out everyone can pick out drums because they're obvious, but like picking out mm -hmm. little subtle things, little nuances. And there are certain producers that were really really great at that that I took inspiration from. So it's like it just becomes this quest to like, okay, this is what kind of the musicians want you to hear, but what's between the lines? What, what meat is in there that I can take and flip where I'm not even touching the main melody, but it's just maybe something ancillary to the side that it could have just been like maybe this, the sound of his fingers coming off the string, off the bass string and it made a certain timbre. I'll take that. You know what I mean? So it's not always about, you know, trying to find loops. And that was the big thing, you know, in the early days was just loops. 
Uh, and then, like, loops kind of became a stigma, like, yo, that's lazy. And then it kind of mm -hmm. came back around to where it was like, all right, if you can use a loop, it shows that you was confident in your beat. You know what I mean? So it changes, man. The mentality, you know, towards and, sampling and, changes. Yeah, and for sure. So when you, when you find a record, you find that sound, do you make the beat around that sound? Or do you already have a beat in your head where you're like, I need that sound to make complete my beat? Do you understand? It varies. Yeah, oh, yeah, definitely. It varies. Okay. Like, sometimes, okay. like, sometimes I'll go, because, I mean, the way that I begin beats is, is, is different. Sometimes I'll hear a sample, and I'll just build it around that. Sometimes yep. I'll, have some, I'll put some drums together, because I'll just sit here and just make drums, drum loops, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So I'll, yeah. I'll sit, and, like, drums is really big for me. Like, I have my, li my drum library is almost as big as my sample library, and it's, like, Shoot. terrifying. Your drums, your drums are crazy. I have yeah. tons of them, and it's, like, I'm obsessed. I've always been obsessed with drums, so it's, like, Sometimes I'll just, you know, I'll put together just drum tracks and just leave it. And it's just the skeleton. Mm -hmm. And it's like, all right, when I find the samples that fit that, then mm -hmm. I'll, you know, I'll lay it down. But then sometimes, you know, like I said, I'll find a sample first and get the drums to match it. But it's always, you know, it, it always starts with one piece and it's like, mm -hmm. and, and then it grows. And it's like, you can't be afraid to let it grow. Like sometimes I'll end up not even using the original sample I picked just because I let oh. it take me somewhere else. You know what I mean? And it might be right. another piece. It might be another piece of that song or something like that, but or it might be nothing at all. Sometimes it'll be just an exercise to where I have to go through it, and it's like, all right, that doesn't work as, as well as I thought it was gonna, and then I'll, I'll I'll go for the next thing. You know what I mean? For sure. Now, for the for the cats who are still, you know, for the producers who are copying records and trying to find that sample, what what do you what would you what is your strategy to kind of digging and in, in, in finding a, a a record to sample? Um, well, I mean, the cover, obviously, a lot of times the cover will pull you in, you know what I mean? Um, if you just see something, like I have, I pulled a couple that I pulled from, and it's like, you just see them, you, you, there's no way you're not going to pull this record. This is, or any producer will know this record. This is classic Skull Snaps right here. This is like... Wow, that there's, cover's there's, crazy. There's drum beats on here that you've heard a billion times over all your favorite MCs, you know what I mean? But just look at that cover, man. You're not passing that joint up. And this is right. years ago. This is from years ago. So that, and right. then sometimes so, it'll just be something like, you know, this is a Lou Rawls joint. And actually a friend of mine used this picture for, for a project that he was doing. Mm. Again, you know what I'm saying? Let's clean up the ghetto. And this is what year, what, year, what year was that? What year this that was, let me see. Uh, 1977. Wow. You know what I mean? And that's the and That's image. still dope. Right. Yeah, and that works right now. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So a lot of times going like, in, so yeah, covers, the cover kind of the cover sways you. Yeah. You feel like yeah. sometimes where where do you feel like also um the record label that it's coming out of also sways Almost you? Definitely. Almost yeah. definitely. Like once you pull like two or three fire artists from a label, then you're definitely looking for that label from that point on. Mm. So that's you know, that's one. And uh and again, like back then when I started, there was no like I started collecting records actually before I was really super into beats, you know what I mean? Because I always just love music. So yeah. I was collecting records at like 11, 12 years old. Oh, and wow. I, I was building my collection from then. And my dad, like I said, my mother and father had a vast collection. This is incorporated into mine now. But yeah. there was always records in the house. So there was like normal for me, you know what I mean? And um, so back, but again, back then it was like, you really didn't know. Like you could, you know, check line of notes of, of artists that came out, see if, you know, if their samples were listed and that could give you clues. But a lot of times, man, it was either just, you know, bands that I knew were dope from just, you know, my listening at home or whatever. And then it was just like, again, it was the cover or I would like definitely check for certain instruments. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? I was big on like vibraphones and like guitars and strings. So it's like, if I seen, you know, familiar names or names that I respected that were playing those instruments, I would definitely right. pull that, you know? Right, right, right. Now nah, that's a dope process, man. That's it, crazy. It varies. it varies too, you know, but it's like, that's, that's the genesis of it, you know?